Hello folks, me and Max Munchkin finally back with a general overview video of Eldritch Shadow, an Eldritch Knight fighter character who uses a lot of brawn and just enough brain to defeat his enemies. His name is Farbane and he is a variant human with a dexterity oriented point by distribution. The odd wisdom score is there to pick up a feat at later point. Intelligence score is somewhat low to begin with, but you will be focusing on martial capabilities more than your spellcasting anyway, so it won't be a hindrance in most cases. In terms of a background, I don't think you will need or even want to annoy your DM with those Ravnica backgrounds for this character in particular. Instead, Faction Agent or Knight of the Order from a Sword Coast Adventures guidebook are very flexible and a good fit both thematically and mechanically. As a rule of thumb, if you do take some other background, aim for dexterity, wisdom or intelligence skill proficiencies, those ability scores are the highest for this character so those skills should be uh, the most important for you. The very core, the essence of this build is very simple, it revolves around Shadow Blade, a spell I often use and praise in my other character build videos. It is the main source of single target melee damage this character concentrates on. While maximum theoretical damage isn't as high as you can accomplish with Great Weapon Master or Polar Master or even Sharpshooter and Crossbow Expert feet combos, you also won't suffer the minus 5 to hit accuracy penalty and you will be able to use more ability score improvements to actually improve your ability scores instead of flooding your character sheet with all these feats. In a lot of cases you'll even have advantage on all of your attack rolls, so you will be hitting and dealing damage way more often. This approach also indirectly makes the character tankier because you can grab a shield with your other free hand, resulting in higher armor class compared to your standard feat master junkies. As an eldritch knight you do need a minimum of 8 levels to learn this spell but in my opinion it is worth the wait just as much as this video is hopefully worth your time so if you're enjoying so far please start mercilessly draining those like, subscribe and bell notification buttons with all of your psychic weaponry. Based on my experience it's the easiest way to defeat the youtube algorithm BBEG so if you want to join my party please do that. Obviously Shadow Blade is a concentration spell, so maintaining it is equally as important as dealing damage with it. All fighters get constitution saving throw proficiency, which is used for keeping concentration, so all you need to minimize the odds of losing your Shadow Blade is the trusty old Warcaster feat. And uh, just like any other fighter out there, you get a slew of core class martial features. For a uh, fighting style, you can either further increase your armor class via defense, or your your damage output via dueling. And the dueling on a fighter makes the most sense compared to all other martial classes because action surge and extra attack features multiply the number of attacks in any given round. Paired with sentinel feet as well as warcaster plus booming blade combo, you have two very reliable ways to attack an enemy one more time every round using your reaction. And speaking about reactions, you have other options at your disposal as well. Tried and tested duo of spells, shield and absorb elements are there to make you the tankiest fighter of all, while featherfall and counterspell can help you deal with sudden falls from great heights and uh, well hostile spellcasters, right? With 7 ability score improvements, fighters can afford to take 1 or 2 more feats compared to most other characters. Besides sentinel and warcaster, you will want to take resilient wisdom as soon as you can, because wisdom saving throws are the most frequent mental saves in the game. And um, Here's a point in this video which may or probably will spark some controversy and discussion in the comments below. I think medium armor master feat offers enough benefits for this character to sacrifice another stat bump. I know, I know the feat is definitely on the weaker end of a power curve, but hear me out, okay? First you grab a stealth skill proficiency right away as a variant human, then once you get 750 gold, which shouldn't be too difficult in most cases, you you can buy half plate. Combined with the fact that you start with 16 in dexterity right away, your armor class effectively goes from 18 with breastplate to 20 with half plate, all while ignoring that annoying disadvantage to stealth checks from half plate being clunky and loud. And if you decide to go full turtle mode and take defense instead of dueling fighting style, your armor class after casting shield spell will be 26. This is without any potential magic armor or magic shields, which can easily 
easily push this number above 30 if your DM is generous enough. Pretty neat, huh? All right, all right. Let me talk a bit more about War Magic feature. All Eldritch Knights get it at level 7 and until level 11, strictly speaking, it allows you to deal a bit more damage per round than your extra attack. See, in theory, instead of just attacking twice with your standard attack action, you can instead use cast a spell action for Booming Blade Cantrip, deal at least 1d8 extra thunder damage, potentially 2d8 if the enemy moves away, and then use your bonus action to attack with your weapon, right? In practice, you do use your bonus action for other things, activating Shadow Blade is one of those, second win maybe on the second round if you get damaged a lot, or even recasting Shadow Blade after rolling two natural ones on a constitution saving throw, which, I mean, it does happen, right? But as long as you're aware that you have this option at your disposal, use it whenever you can, more damage is always better damage, right? Of course, once you hit level 11 and your extra attack feature gives you three attacks every time you use the attack action, it is always usually better to just swing your shadow blade three times instead of casting cantrip spells and then bonus action and all of that crap, right? Uh, Indomitable feature is there to help you with failed saving throws, you can often combine it with absorb elements spell and basically reduce a crap ton of elemental damage coming your way from let's say dragon's breath or some high level spell, you know, reduce it to a more manageable number. Uh, due to your relatively lower intelligence score, Eldritch Strike isn't a feature you will want to rely on a lot in most cases, but if you do have action surge and most of your higher level spell slots, you can definitely combine your martial and magical capabilities together to improve the odds of enemies failing their saving throws against your spells. Arcane Charge is situational, but extra mobility is often very useful and allows you to close the distance with or maybe get away from the enemy. Improved War Magic is cool as well because you can cast a spell and attack during the same turn, maximizing your action economy even further. And speaking about spells, you do get to learn 13 of them by the time you hit level 20. You learn them exclusively from the wizard's list and for the most part you are limited to only abjuration and evocation schools of magic, with fighter levels 3, 8, 14 and 20, allowing you to learn one more from any school. These choices will depend on the setting, party composition, DM's style and your own preferences, but here's how I would go about picking these spells. Besides the booming blade cantrip, light or control flames cantrips will allow you to see better, while the usual go-tos like minor illusion, mage hand, message or prestidigitation can be picked at level 10. For a level 1 spells, again, shield and absorb elements are a must take in my opinion. For your non-evocation, non-abjuration spell, I take featherfall, though you can probably manage without it too. As a 4th level 1 spell, I'd go for protection from evil and good, it's a cheap and effective defensive layer against most of the usual hostile creature types. For level 2 spells, other than the obvious shadow blade, which you pick at character level 8, I'd go for warding with at level 7, you can also replace featherfall with misty step or mirror image, shatter is a solid AoE that can situationally rearrange the environment, be careful when you cast it in caves or small rooms. Scorching Ray has enough attack rolls to minimize the downside of your lower intelligence score. And for level 3 spells, Counterspell is almost a no-brainer. Even with low intelligence score, you always have a chance to stop enemy spellcasters, unlike other fighters. Pick Fireball or Lightning Bolt for some AoE damage, or use Magic Circle as a turbocharged protection from evil and good, or, you know, just a temporary prison. At level 14, there are a ton of good choices, but I would personally most likely go for either Blink Fly or Major Image. In the level 4 spell category, I think you can't go wrong with Fire Shield for a ton of extra damage against hordes and melee multi-attackers. Banishment is solid as well for a bit of extra battlefield control, you do only have one level 4 spell slot, so use these two spells wisely. And then we come to the items. I usually don't cover these, but recently I started, so I might as well do it for this character. Our Ruby of the War Mage is a low-hanging fruit, a common item that you shouldn't have too many problems convincing your DM to give to you, either in some magic shop or just in some loot. It's a common item, it's like 50, 100 gold worth of uh, magic item, it shouldn't be too hard to get and it will definitely help um, with your spell casting material components. Goggles of Night are always good on any character who doesn't have dark vision, even more on this character considering how Shadow Blade works best in dim light or darkness. Adamantine armor roughly halves the damage of those pesky critical hits which every now and then do come your way, but if you can get it with an extra plus one, plus two or maybe even plus 
plus 3 benefit, which is, I think, legendary type of, you know, bonus, that's even better, right? A plus 1 or higher shield is a no-brainer too, your armor class can never be too high. Mantle of Spell Resistance, as the name says, gives you an extra layer of protection against hostile magic, while a Ring of Spell Storing makes your spell slot management a bit easier to deal with. Ion Stones of Agility and Intellect, as well as the Manual of Quickness of Action and Tome of Clear Thought, are all good as well because they increase your raw ability scores that you depend on. This isn't an exhaustive list by any stretch of imagination, there are many more magic items that can definitely benefit you, but it's a good starting point if you have absolutely no idea what magic gear to even go for. Uh, let's do some magic calculations now, it wouldn't be a min-max munchkin video without at least a little bit of math, right? As always, I assume everything hits, it's much easier that way, even with, with fighters many attacks, the sample size of attack rolls in a typical combat encounter that lasts 3 to 5 rounds in most cases is still too low to be statistically significant. You will sometimes roll 2 crits in a row, but you will also sometimes miss 3 times in a row even with advantage, that happens, it happened to me many many times, such is the nature of the game, right? So assuming dim light conditions, character level 20 and dueling fighting style, you are very likely to connect with most if not all of your attacks and deal decent damage, well depending on the armor class, right? Because Shadow Blade provides automatic advantage in dim light or darkness and deals 3d8 plus dexterity plus dueling damage on each hit, which is 20.5 psychic damage on average per each hit. With your standard attack action giving you 4 swings, your action surge doubling this to 8 attacks, your sentinel feat using your reaction for 1 extra 1 more attack against an enemy who attacks your allies, that's 9 total attacks in the very first round of combat, amounting to a total of roughly 185 psychic damage. You can do this one more time in a round number 2 and then you're down to your standard 4 or 5 attacks, dealing in between 80 to 100 damage per round. In some cases you may even be able to stack additional 13.5 average thunder damage with your sentinel plus warcaster plus booming blade attack of opportunity combo. While this is definitely not the highest, this is very sustainable damage output, especially in higher tier 2 and tier 3 character progression, when you have enough spell slots to burn through, you know, just casting shadow blade shield all of those other spells so you can actually maintain uh, your damage and uh, when it comes to progression it's pretty straightforward as you can see on your screen uh, learn your most important spells grab all the feats you need and want and you're good to go right you can choose to double and triple down on your martial capabilities so maximizing constitution instead of bumping your intelligence score is a viable choice but i really think that you have a fair few spells at your disposal that will benefit from slightly higher spell save DCs and uh, spell attack bonuses. If you ever play this type of Eldritch Knight, I fully expect you to deviate a bit or maybe even a lot and make your own spell choices depending on a party composition, campaign, setting, world, your DM's style, maybe there's a lot of combat, maybe there's just a little bit of combat, but just enough that there actually needs to be a character like yours to ensure that there's no death or problems or, you know, bad outcomes, right? Uh, role playing this character is a breeze in my opinion, you can lean onto your background choice and base a lot of this character's decisions and motivations on faction or knighthood allegiances. You can also play it as a warrior who diligently practices his martial and magical skills for his own selfish interests. I can easily see this character being evil, but I can also easily see it being good. His most natural state is probably somewhere around the neutral spectrum, because certain aspects of his magic draw from darker, more sinister sources, while other are purely protective and, you know, defensive, neutral in their application. Most importantly, this type of character is quite flexible and can be tied into pretty much any setting and any world, any campaign. There are a million little factions, guilds, knight orders and other organizations and groups of people that would be interested in associating themselves with you in some way, shape or form, in some fashion, either through mere membership on your part or some type of cooperative partnership stemming from 
mutual goals and interests. As uh, you can see me scrolling through it on the screen, I've typed out the usual word file that I prepare for characters like this one. If you would like to download it, head on over to my Patreon page and pledge into the Magical Secrets tier. It's not mandatory, it's 100% optional, especially in these troubled, globally challenging economic times. But if you do find the Patreon perks worth the trouble, worth your time and worth your money, consider supporting my efforts there. Alternatively, you can wait a few days for my detailed build breakdown video where I will be going over all these points listed in this file and sharing some finer details on this build. So if you don't want to miss that video, like, subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified when it gets published. Special shout out to all of my current patrons, Mike, Matthew, Ewing, Barley, Man, Hardly Trying, Rogor, Kellerons, Suburban Hell, Gary Kors, Brad Olham, Sean Bauer, Joel Alcazar, Sean Manozzi, Stefano, Clea, Decoya, Bitten B, Jeremy, Soroy, Lunatic Dragon, Alex Bell, Harry Howell, Crack Mask, Alexandria O'Day, Nathan, Nicholas, Joseph, Francisco Martinez, Keelan, Udell18, The Undead, Owl Goddess, Ted Rygard, Stephen Keezer, Derek Peck, Barb and Vernis Posting, Devon Troger, Sean Walker, James Randolph, Wesley Schick, Matthew Joyce, Edge Walker, Jacob Nether, Pixel Junkie, Robin Smith, John O'Katz, Skylar Beverly, Techie3D, Jacob Salters, Paul Gibbs, Step Brothers, Vicky Redstone, uh, Thomas Gardner, Ch uh, Sharby, Burley Bourne, Brian Tobek, Zachary Dionas, Christopher Pistachio, Ro Rogers Wright, Super Neil, Abby Coates, Hector Monterey, Lucky B, Sterling Garza, Sneaky B, Pedro, uh, Storty, John Williamson, J James Harris, Jamie Harris, Todd John Gamma, Paul Spencer, Artemio, Alec Greenwood, and Brent Wailing. Thank you for your continued support. If I missed anybody, I'm sorry. Either way, I'll make sure you get many more videos like this one in the following weeks and months. With everything said and done, Minmax Munch King out, and um, talk to you soon.